I can. Using a mouse to advance slides. Cool. All right. This talk, uh, I got way too excited about and put a whole lot of content in, so we're really going to move this time, uh, especially if we want to stay under time. Let's go. All right. Strange tides. Familiar shores. Uh, this is the first voyage metaphor you're going to get, and there's two the whole time. That's the best I could shoehorn in. <laughs> All right. So quick bit of history. I ran about six months ago. Uh, I was invited to apply for an internship at Rush Digital. Uh, I went in for an internship uh, interview. Uh, I sat down the interview. The interviewer came in and he said, I'm really excited. I've been really excited all week for this interview. And I was like, yes, this is what I want in my life. And then he goes, because I read your CV and you've rated yourself 9 out of 10 in C++, and I've been doing this for 30 years, and I would never give myself a rating like that. <laughs> and I went, oh, no, and my soul left my body. <laughs> and that interview was an actual slaughter. Um, but somehow I got a job there, um, it worked out, and it was an awesome interview in that I learned tons and tons of things in the interview just from being slammed on how wrong I was about them. Um, <laughs> but it, it, set up, it set up kind of the nature of my time at Rush so far, which has been uh, an illustration of how much I don't know about computer science and how much I can learn, and I've learned so many things. And so what I wanted to do today is kind of share some of the things that I've learned today uh, and talk to you guys about why they're awesome and why you should do them. So we're going to be talking about two topics today, uh, computer vision, um, and chatbots or natural language processing. And we'll get a little bit more into them in a second, but uh, before I do that, uh, we just need to talk a little bit about why I'm relevant to this uh, sort of topics. Uh, so I'm a, a software engineer. I graduated from media design school. Uh, and as a result of graduating from media design school, I'm a game developer like most of the people here. Um, I'm ridiculously fanatical about VR. I pretty much shoehorned VR into every assignment I was given in media design school, um, even when lecturers didn't want me to. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'm really into developing tools, so anything I can make to make you guys make better stuff is pretty exciting to me. So with that in mind, we're going to start talking about computer vision. And computer vision is, is kind of interesting, because at first glance, it does what it says on the box. It's giving computers vision. Um, it's essentially image processing, but turned up to 11, um, which makes it kind of interesting. But it's a little bit of a misnomer um, in the reality of the situation. Uh, computer vision, at least I think, should be called something closer to computer perception. Uh, and the reason is that computer vision isn't so much about processing images as it's about uh, perceiving and understanding the content of images for computers. It's applying artificial intelligence to image processing so you can extract and understand information out of it, which is uh, kind of exciting. Uh, essentially, it's image processing with intent. Um, but for most people here, computer vision is probably a fairly uh, strange topic that you maybe haven't even heard of before. So I thought we'd go through a quick example first, which is the first thing that I ever did with computer vision at Rush, and it's motion detection. Uh, so in most security systems, you'll have motion detection that uses infrared or laser light uh, to figure out if someone's moving in the room. But you can actually deploy a really easy and lightweight motion detection on a camera, just a webcam, an Arduino, Raspberry Pi, a laptop. Um, and the best, <laughs> the best use I found for this was defending your fridge when your coworkers are trying to steal your delicious cake. Um, as a disclaimer, I don't recommend recording your coworkers without their consent, um, <laughs> even in defense of cake. Uh, basically, uh, what you do is you take a webcam and you have it record information and then you feed it into a computer vision library. Uh, the most popular one is just OpenCV. And what you essentially are going to do is uh, a video is made up of tons and tons of frames, 60, 30 per second. So you take the last frame that happened and the frame that you have currently and you compare them. Uh, all of them have colors for every pixel, so you just compare the colors. And if there's a change in colors, you can probably guess that there's motion there. Um, but it kind of uh, massively overdetects everything. <laughs> To start with, uh, cameras have a lot of kind of color aberrations in them and stuff like that. So you might get a little bit of color shift you weren't expecting. So the first thing that you're going to end up doing uh, if you try to do this sort of thing is you're going to take all of the color out of things. Uh, once you remove all of the color and kind of grayscale it down, essentially every pixel is going to be uh, between a, a zero value of blackness and a one value of blackness. So then you can just take each frame and subtract them from each other and you get an image that looks kind of like the top image there, a uh, white kind of weird blur, but it's all of the pixels that have changed. Um, from that white blur, then we're going to threshold it. So we're just going to clamp it. If it's greater than a certain amount of whiteness, we'll make it entirely white. If it's not, we'll make it entirely black. And that gives you essentially a pretty tight uh, motion detection algorithm, which is cool. Um, so from there, we're going to go ahead and select the motion, like this dog uh, that is motioning. Uh, usually in uh, computer vision, you're going to just put a, a green box around it for visual debugging purposes. But the purpose of selecting the motion um, is to kind of uh, reduce your problem space. So if you have like a 1080p video, there's a whole lot of pixels to go through. If you select just the bits that are moving so you can do more processing on it, uh, then it's a lot less processing to do. It's going to be a lot faster, a lot more optimal. Um, which is exciting because once we start to select things, we can do 
more things with them, like you see in that right image, uh, is all those faces have been selected, and then we start doing things like face tracking or facial recognition, all kinds of different things to identify information out of them. So, computer vision is actually used a whole lot in the current day. Um, augmented reality systems are mostly based on computer vision. Uh, you get things like uh, marker-based augmented reality is just identifying if an image looks like another image and then activating things off of it. Um, and you get the kind of newer AR kit and AR core systems on mobile, the uh, most famous of which is the IKEA app at the moment that lets you place furniture into your lounge and see what it looks like and it cuts all the lighting and everything like that, which is kind of fun. Um, for some reason, when I looked up augmented reality, I got a picture of a girl on a bicycle with a VR headset, which is not only... <laughs> um, which is not only not uh, augmented reality, but extremely dangerous. Please don't do that. Uh, but you also can do face tracking, so identifying facial features and landmarks and then kind of uh, playing with them and understanding how someone's face is moving and stuff like that. Uh, and you can track a whole lot of things beyond the face, but we're going to talk a little bit more about face tracking first because it's kind of exciting and it has the most relevance to games. So how can we use face tracking? Um, well, the first thing you can do with face tracking is basically just put it as a, a game input. So. Um, the example that I've chosen is if you wanted to make a rhythm game that was controlled entirely with your eyebrows, you could do that. A rhythm game controlled entirely with your eyebrows would be very difficult to play, but would be amazing for streamers that get a lot of views, so you might sell pretty decently. Um, more realistically, in games like Star Citizen, have started to use uh, the facial tracking. They feed it in from a webcam, and so when you talk in the game, your face moves with it and animates like you. It kind of saves a little bit of time on their making animation or trying to make a system that would match the lip movements to your voice. Um, but it also allows you to express a whole lot more of your language uh, with your face into the game, which is sort of exciting. Uh, conversely, you can't make funny faces when your friends say things that are dumb. Uh, so, you know, your mileage may vary. Um, but the cool thing about face tracking is we can start to use it as an analytic. Um, so if you're playtesting your game, most, play, uh, most uh, face tracking applications are, are pretty light now. So you can start to get input on like say if someone smiled. So uh, rather than kind of guessing if someone's enjoying your game or anything like that, during a playtest you can capture all of their smiles or frowns if it's a horror game, maybe screams, um, and take that as an analytic and kind of look at where that happened. Um, Uncharted games and with Naughty Dog do this a little bit, not with face tracking, but more specifically with heat mapping, they find areas that uh, players get stuck on or look at a lot, and then they use those areas to kind of smooth and, and streamline the gameplay experience for players. And this is sort of the same thing. You can find a, a heat map, essentially, of your gameplay experience of when people were smiling or happy or anything like that. Um, and then you can start to do something kind of interesting with it, which is the last thing I want to talk about, which is active analytics. Um, basically, rather than just taking those analytics out, you can just feed them directly back into your game and let the game start to react to them. Um, this is so, sort of something that Left 4 Dead games started to do with the AI director, where the director would adapt to gameplay and make it so the players got the optimal experience for them. It was never too hard or too easy by adjusting the amount of zombie spawns. Um, by understanding a player's facial movements, like smiles, frowns, screams, you can start to adapt uh, your gameplay experience to that. So if someone's smiling a lot, you can present them more of the content that they're smiling from. If they're frowning a little bit or don't look super engaged based off your metrics, you can wind back content that they're not so interested in. Um, there's a particularly interesting game that does this called Nevermind, um, which you may have heard of. Um, it didn't do super well at the time, but it got quite famous for the fact that it used basically a heart rate monitor that came packaged with the game. Uh, you attach the heart rate monitor to you and it's a, heart, it's a horror game. So basically as your heart rate rises, it makes the game worse. Um, <laughs> which is a very interesting approach to a feedback loop. Um, <laughs> but uh, it did kind of interestingly in streaming and all that kind of stuff. The really interesting thing about Nevermind, uh, slightly as a side, is it became a really good system for treating uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, which was pretty important at the time because of the fact that every time you basically reacted to it, it got worse. It forced people to develop coping mechanisms. So while it's not necessarily relevant to my talk at the time, active analytics can definitely be used to kind of create these interesting feedback systems that can be used for treatment or other sort of systems like that. Another kind of tracking that we can kind of use that's interesting is uh, skeletal tracking. And skeletal tracking is uh, kind of fascinating in that it's something that was provided by the Microsoft Connect. Uh, the Connect has actually just been discontinued, which is quite sad for a lot of people who are using it not for making games. Um, but the skeletal tracking is uh, particularly important, um, and it sort of is so because of uh, something that I witnessed. So uh, when we were recently doing research for one of our new projects, uh, one of my coworkers mapped the skeletal tracking from a Kinect onto a 3D character so that your character mirrored the skeletal movements that you had. Um, and it caught my eye across the room because he was just talking to someone, but it captured all of the character 
of the animation uh, sort of thing. Like suddenly the character just had so much character, which as a programmer probably doesn't make a lot of sense to any artist in the room. But um, that's my understanding of art, so let's roll with it. Um, so something really interesting happened from that is that I built a, a system in Unity. So Unity's animation system lets you uh, record animations in the editor. So you can hit the record button, move stuff around, and then it will record that as keyframes and move it along. Um, if you uh, tweak that system a little bit, you can record those live and in real time. Um, and so you can basically move around and build essentially homemade mocap systems uh, to get animation data out of it. Um, really, what's the point, though? <laughs> Um, well, uh, realistically, it is just a cheap version of mocap, but you can kind of do uh, some pretty interesting things. Uh, for animators, I think it's a kind of cool way to translate a very human series of motions into a much more digital form, a uh, way that you can see it, and you can export those animations out of Unity into Maya or 3DS or whatever you choose to animate in, and actually see what those motions look like um, and how they sort of move as translations and get a better feel for them, as essentially attached to your rig. Um, for programmers, I think it's even cooler um, purely because you can buy a lot of assets, but you almost never find uh, an asset that has the exact animations you want. But if you can rig the skeleton of a humanoid animation, sorry, of a hum humanoid model up, and then just do the motions yourself and maybe tweak them just a little bit, but not have to worry about the broader scope of doing all these animations, it opens up a lot of space for you, uh, not necessarily for like your final production quality title, but maybe at least to get like a prototype ready so you can uh, illustrate points with key animations. And that's kind of really powerful and really cool. But essentially what we've been talking up, uh, about up till now is uh, computer vision and its, its way of uh, digitizing humanity, essentially. It, it takes a lot of the human interactions and the, human, uh, the, the ways that humans interact with systems and digitizes it into a form that not only computers can understand, but even we can understand a little bit better. And that's kind of important because what we're gonna talk about now is the exact opposite. We're gonna take something very digital and turn it into something much more human. Um, with chatbots. Um, chatbots, or natural language processing, uh, are systems that have been around for quite a time. Uh, you might recognize them from calling a telco or any other major uh, place and having to press zero or having it talk to you. Um, perhaps even instant messaging bots. Um, I recently talked to an instant messaging bot while I was researching for this, and I said, how are you? And it said, I love Asian fusion culture. Um, <laughs> which kind of sums up my experience with a lot of chatbots in general, and that's kind of interesting. Um, but also you get helpful bots like the ones you might find on Slack that just identify keywords and respond to you in helpful fashions and that's kind of interesting too. But at the heart of all these is the fact that it's trying to create a way to interact with a computer that's much more human in nature. A way that you can just talk to a computer and it understands. And for that I'm going to introduce uh, my second speaker, hopefully. <laughs> Hello Josh. Hey, there we go. How are you today? I'm good. Where are we? Play by play. Oh, hello play by play. <laughs> uh, so this is Justin, um, and I think he can probably do his introduction himself. So. Would you like to introduce yourself? My name is Justin. I am a fully synthetic conversational AI, but you can call me a chat bot. So Justin, just like he says, is a fully synthetic conversational AI. So he's a Unity deployed uh, application that uh, basically uses cloud technologies to understand speech, uh, convert it into a conversation, and then talk back to you. Um, while he does respond to specific commands, he also interpolates between them, so he understands conversation and maintains a context of that conversation. Um, he's going to talk to you a little bit more about how he works. How do you work? Sure. I have three modules. Transcription, analysis, and synthesis. When you talk to me, each of my modules works in sequence to process our conversation and respond to you. Nice. So just like Justin said, he has three modules, which you can see up on the screen there. His first module is transcription. Basically, he takes a clip of my voice, um, and he transcribes it into text, which he sends back to the Unity app. The Unity app dispatches it to a different system where it gets analyzed in a system called Dialogflow, which is provided by Google. Uh, Dialogflow is a neural network that's trained to sort of uh, identify and understand speech. And it does so by mm, basically doing neural network things. <laughs> uh, from there, he sends back a response, a thing that he, he thinks is uh, basically a valid response to what you're talking about. 
It's not always a valid response to what you're talking about, but it's pretty close to valid most of the time. Um, after that, Justin then synthesizes his own voice. So he dispatches all that information to a different cloud service called Amazon's Polly. Um, and Polly basically takes all of those words and makes it into a voice. He doesn't sound as bad as Microsoft Sam, but he still doesn't sound real. Um, and that's going to become kind of more relevant as we go on. But something really cool that Justin can do um, is change his voice dynamically, uh, which hopefully I can show you now. Time skip. Sorry, can you say that again? Time skip. Oh God, what did you just do? Not only can just an age, but he can actually swap gender as well. Change gender. Can you say that again? Swap gender. No, Josh, please stop it. So uh, in addition to his, uh, his uh, sex changing, Justin can also simulate a ton of different accents. Um, he's been trained basically with uh, different languages, uh, accents, and voices from all over the world. So he can synthesize those in a whole lot of different ways to give you a pretty broad range of voices. Um, all right, so uh, let's talk a little bit more about these sequences. So first of all, we've got transcription. Transcription is fairly straightforward. Um, it takes a clip of my voice. Um, usually, he would use an ambient microphone that would uh, identify whether or not someone was talking. And if you look at things like Siri or Google Assistant, they're usually trained to your voice which is why you have to talk to them a whole bunch to start with. Um, from there, he transcribes that into words that are a lot easier to process in all kinds of different systems rather than just using voice the whole time. Um, and he does this using a service called Google uh, Speech to Text. It's very creatively named. Uh, but why is this relevant to us as game designers? Well, essentially, um, we can start to use voice as a key press or a form of input. We can start to do very different things with it. Um, this is especially important in VR games. Uh, in, in a lot of kind of uh, traditional PC games, you can get away with your character having a voice that's not yours. Um, when your eyes are the same as the character's eyes and you're moving as the character and everything about you is the character, it gets very confusing when a voice that's not yours comes out of your face. Um, especially if you're not the same gender or ethnicity as that, um, it can be kind of problematic to the way that you interact with the game. Um, and that's kind of interesting in the ways that we can sort of allow you to talk directly to your game in a way that's a lot more normal and natural uh, for you. But uh, next, we go ahead and we analyze that conversation. Justin uses a system called Dialogflow to understand the communications you give him. Dialogflow is a neural network, like I said earlier, but it's very plain text in terms of how you code and manage it. You give him sentences that he should recognize, um, and he interpolates between a series of sentences, and then you give him responses that he should give along that. Additionally, Justin also understands context. So throughout your entire session of conversing with him, he keeps track of what he said to you or what you've been saying so that he can respond in more dynamic and realistic ways. Uh, and finally, he's able to draw entities out uh, from information. So if you're looking for particular pieces of information from things that people have said, uh, dates, names, anything like that, Justin can identify them from a sentence structure and then pull them out and allow them to be sent back to you to handle in any way you want, whether you want to set, uh, set values in your game or you just want him to respond in ways that use information you've given him, like your name or anything like that. Um, when we apply this to games, we can use that neural network to start to build significantly more reactive conversations. Um, the conversation wheel is a pretty common thing that you see in games, um, and it gives you very straightforward answers. Um, in the case of Dragon Age, it tells you if something is going to be aggressive or nice or lovely, and so on and so forth. Um, it's not the most uh, intuitive way of interacting for a lot of people, and it tends to put you in a role-playing state of mind. You're playing someone else. Um, if we have these reactive conversation modules uh, built out of dialogue flow, the conversation can stop being uh, so kind of cut and dry, and you can build them in such ways that anything that you say to them can be interpreted and managed. Uh, it stops being sort of a, a strict structure that you converse with NPCs in, and you start to talk in your own way. You don't need to role play anyone. You can be yourself, and you can interact as yourself. It takes that barrier away, and it's kind of important to the way that we go about things. Um, in addition to that, you can deploy dialogue flow across thousands of NPCs if you wanted to. Um, to give each of them kind of unique and interactive personalities. And because it's a web portal that sits outside of uh, the game itself, um, like Justin just deploys as a Unity package, uh, and then you just tell him anything you want to say. Uh, and so essentially, if you have writers and they want to test their writing 
or put writing into the game or tweak it. They don't need to interact with your game engine whatsoever. They interact with a portal outside of all of that. They just write, and then it just appears in your game. Um, and the reason that it appears in your game is the synthesis system, which is the last part of Justin. Um, Justin's synthesis system takes uh, basically anything that you give it and turns it into words and conversation. Um, and this is kind of cool, although it's still fairly new. Um, like I said before, it still sounds a little bit Microsoft Sammy. You probably wouldn't use these voices in a game uh, unless you were going to uh, put all of them into a game and then shape the game very much around the robot voices. Um, but uh, the voice synthesis system basically has a special language behind it um, called uh, speech synthesis markup language. Again, very creatively named. Um, and that sort of lets you dictate what kind of accents you are, kind of inflections, pauses, breaks, and the speed that you want them to talk at. It gives you a whole lot of customization in the way that you can make this person talk, essentially. Um, and when you add that into uh, games, uh, something kind of interesting happens. Uh, right now, uh, voice acting is, is kind of a very much a triple A thing. Um, as we move forward and we get these voice synthesis modules better and better, uh, you're going to start to see voice acting probably not become such a triple A thing. If you can deploy voices uh, dynamically like this, especially if you can re-script them on the fly, which is one of the coolest things that Justin does, um, like we talked about before in that analysis module, um, you can just deploy voice acting to your game. And beyond that, you can prototype voice acting in your game. If you want to test if your dialogue or anything like that works, uh, you can deploy a system like this and just let them talk to you. Um, if you've got a game that's going to be very heavily based on a, like a voice narrative or anything like that, you might not necessarily want to uh, get like uh, someone to voice act that while you're still figuring out exactly what you want them to say and prototyping and everything like that. So these sort of systems right now are really good for prototyping in that you can just put voice systems straight into your game, voice acting straight into your game, and have it be very flexible and dynamic to illustrate your point. And then later you can replace it with real voice actors if you want to, or you can keep rolling with the synthetic voice if that works better for you. So where are we going with this? Well, um, right now, it's a pretty cool kind of party trick, but it's not exactly a AAA ready. Um, but the reality is that they're only going to get better and better and better and better. And all of these systems are only going to get better and better. So we can start to do all kinds of things with them. Uh, these are systems that you can put straight into your game. And like I said before, they're going to be really, really important for indie games. Um, being able to voice act with so little resource required and so little money is going to be a pretty big deal. And as we start to integrate them more and more into games, they're going to get whole different sets of contexts. Right now, Justin has the context of a single conversation. But if he's attached to an NPC that has an entire lifetime in a game like Skyrim, he can take his entire life as a context for that conversation. He can start to build out like a really proper and backed narrative to the way he talks. And using neural networks, he can deliver it pretty convincingly and adjust it during gameplay uh, to make kind of impressive and very realistic conversations that might be kind of amazing. Um, on top of that, the more he interacts with people, the more he's able to steal their habits. Um, because he is a neural network, the more information and voice you give him, he grows and grows and grows and grows and understands more about different accents, different pronunciations, and different kind of habits you have. So he's going to be able to steal those habits the more the player plays the game and even interact with them in quirky ways that might feel very close and important to them. Uh, and that is kind of cool. Basically, the chatbot technology is going to break down that barrier through a keyboard or those really strict and structured areas that you have to interact with in very specific ways and just let you interact in a much more natural and normal fashion. So that's all for me for the time being, but a few quick thanks. Uh, big thanks to Rush Digital, obviously, for supporting me and allowing me to come down here. Uh, there's been a whole lot of criticism and wit provided me to kind of tune this talk up nicely, and I think that's been awesome. Uh, obviously, thank you to Play by Play and all of you for coming. A special thank you uh, from the Play by Play team to Navi, uh, who had to talk to Justin for about two weeks, and he just would not talk back to her at all. So I think she's probably racked up about two hours of talking to a computer that wouldn't talk back. <laughs> um, another special thank you to Lucy, who's also included in the Play by Play team. Um, for a lot of uh, myself and my peers who are here, at, who are from uh, Media Design School, uh, Lucy was a lecturer to us for a year, and uh, she constantly pushed us to try and share our passions with the greater community, um, of which it's only taken me three years to get to. <laughs> um, and obviously there's thanks to many, many more people who have talk, put, up, put up with me, not only talking to a computer constantly, but also to myself constantly, um, which I think has driven my partner a little bit mental. Um, a final special thank you to Poppy Durad, because she asked me to thank her, and I think that's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty dope. 
That's bold, so she can get a thanks for that. Uh, finally, if you want to get in touch with me, here's my Twitter and my email address. If you have any questions about anything I've talked about or you want me to help you with any of it, feel free to hit me up. Uh, if you want to interact with Rush in any ways, uh, we have a, a Twitter and also a blog at rushdigital.news where we just talk about the latest and greatest in technology. Um, and finally, if you want to talk to me specifically about Rush, you can contact me on my Rush email address. Uh, other than that, thanks so much for all your time, and so long, and thanks for all the fish. <laughs>